if if we are going to be reviewing the coaching carousel, we might as well take a spin. I have it as 25 coaching changes in the last cycle. Just 10 of those 25 coaches made it to a bowl game. Only nine finished with a winning record. That would be Jamie Chadwell, Jeff Brom, Barry Odom, David Braun, GJ Kinney, Tim Beck, Luke Fickle, Brent Key, Alex Galesh. Shout out to Hugh Freeze, who made a bowl but lost it six and seven. Uh, we begin our review in the Big Ten, where... Uh, Matt Rule went five and seven at Nebraska. David Braun went eight and five at Northwestern. Ryan Walters four and eight at Purdue. Luke Fickle seven and six at Wisconsin. Danny, of those four, for either it exceeded your expectations, surprised you, you know, which one of those do you think you've got the the best feel on or uh, heading into twenty twenty four? Ooh, going forward. Yeah, going forward. I'd say Matt Rule. I think you know the foundation that he laid. I thought you saw a lot of improvement defensively and he won five games despite maybe the worst quarterback play in the entire country last year mm. and there were a lot of one possession games where they were in it plus you include getting dylan rayola like all of that you're like okay they're set up to take another step forward in year two i would say it wasn't even the worst quarterback play in their own division oh, oh nobody will agree with that yeah. <laughs> hold on let me go compare them <laughs> oh, no, it was, yeah i just i just wrote a story on this last week it was that's the thing like iowa a lot of teams in the big 10 last year owe iowa a debt of gratitude for covering up how inept some of their passing offenses were okay and also maybe making their past defenses look better yeah. When we're all when we're all sorting the pass efficiency defense uh tom do you think that matt rule accomplished all of his goals for what you would want from because what what is it the uh the temple baylor template does have a one-year kind of hard mm -hmm. reset before you start to take those steps forward do you think that's in play in lincoln um yes and no in that i think like the temple baylor situations were much larger kind of you had to gut those things and start over i don't think you had to completely gut what was at nebraska when you took over so i don't think he accomplished all his goals because i'm sure getting to a bowl game was one of the goals but i think overall i mean yeah you hit a lot of you saw a lot of things that you wanted to do you know like danny mentioned the defense improvement the offense still needed work but I do think the quarterback play had a lot to do with that. But I also think, you know, Matt Rule was part of the reason Jeff Sims was there. That's who they chose to go out and get. And that didn't work out well for him. So they missed on that one. And then Harburg takes over and that wasn't really any better. But I, I do think if you're a Nebraska fan going into this year, you had the first, you know, he's hired last December or whatever. You've got your first recruiting class, your first spring going in, blah, blah, blah. And now you've had another entire recruiting cycle. And I think if you look at the landmarks, there's plenty of reason to be optimistic. And with Rayola, if he lives up to his potential, Nebraska is a team that when you look at the Big Ten, like I did my power rankings, they came out today for the league. Like once you get past the top three or four teams in that league right now, there's really a giant like vacuum waiting to be filled by somebody. And if Rayola has that kind of season, I think Matt Rule's got Nebraska in a place where they could step into it and be one of the better teams in the league. I, I'm not – I'm more down on year one for Matt Rule than y'all are, and yet I'm not down on his ultimate likelihood of success at Nebraska. Uh, and they had to reshuffle a good bit of their like back office and some of their recruiting staff, which indicates to me maybe he didn't make the right hires there. Mm. Uh, I think we've kind of – or I have really been down on Satterfield as a coach. He brought him along. Now he, you know, sort of <coughs> pseudo-demoted, you know, slash uh, other voices will be heard with the offense this year. I think that's a good thing. But it did feel like they kind of wasted year one a little bit uh, of Matt Rule to me. And I, I have a lot of confidence in his guys, just his competency. So I, I'm not really changing my opinion on his likelihood of success in the long term, but I, I don't think it was a good first year to miss a bowl there with, with the schedule that they had. I, I thought they should have made a bowl. Or were you um, – I think that's definitely fair. Uh, Bud, were you surprised that Luke Fickle was not better or did not or that Wisconsin did not win more games in his first year coming over from Cincinnati? A, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still pretty high on Luke Fickle – as a coach and some of the other teams in that division were, were pretty poor. Uh, so 
I thought they should have done a better job of, you know, taking advantage of that. Now, on the flip side, I do think some of the results probably speak to maybe some of the whispers about what the previous staff did recruiting wise being true. Um, mm -hmm. And there were some like, why why would you fire? It was Paul Chris. You know, why, why would you get rid of Paul Chris? To show. I mean, outwardly, I think there are maybe some reasons, but this has to be something where the people who are really inside that program are making the determination that it's just not going to get right and not move in the right direction with how they're managing things or how they're bringing in talent. And I, I do think we saw probably a lack of talent from the existing roster there. Uh, we'll, we'll see what they can do in year two. Yeah, I wasn't that surprised by it. Like okay. I, I kind of talked about it last offseason. This was it's a huge yeah. transition going from what Wisconsin had been to what Luke Fickle and you know Phil Longo were going to be doing with that offense. And even in the transfer portal, one short offseason is not a lot of time to completely overhaul the personnel you need to change your kind of systems that way. And I, it was kind of a hybrid based on personnel and what they wanted to do. And then you toss in like Tanner Mordecai getting banged up. But I was also pretty blunt and skeptical about Tanner Mordecai last offseason as well. I do agree that in a down year for the Big Ten West, even by Big Ten West standards, you you could make the argument Wisconsin should have been better. But I wasn't that shocked by like what they were seven and five. See, you, I, you, you, you were on this the whole time. Uh, yeah. 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 I was not. I was on the bullish this could work quick with Luke Fickle, and I was wrong. I think the thing that's glaringly just what makes the season feel like a failure is back to back losses against Indiana and mm -hmm. Northwestern. You know, but then I mean you could find a flip it. We haven't talked about Northwestern yet. But David Braun might have had one of the best coaching jobs in the whole country last year, what he would do at Northwestern. But still, if you're Wisconsin, that's that's kind of those gut-wrenching losses. Those two in a row really hurt the outlook of the season. Yeah, all four of these Big Ten coaching changes were in the Big Ten West. You could argue all four of them had opportunities because of the margin of separation in that division to be two wins or so better. Uh, Danny, you mentioned, you mentioned David Braun there. No. I put this in the rundown. He, we count him for this cycle, right? We've got mm -hmm. okay. He was named. He was named. He coached the entire season. He coached yeah. the entire season. He all those wins are 100 percent attributed to him, and he started fall camp as the head coach of the team. He was not the contractual head coach. I think until a little bit later, but we're going to call him. He was a, he was a hire from the last off season. Yeah, I and he I, I he might have done the best job. I had I thought it was going to come apart at the seams. Uh, I thought it was going to be a one or two win season. I mean, remember they had the lawsuit. The coaches wore the t-shirts kind of coming together. They got in trouble for that. They had to shut that down. I'm just wondering where the heck the morale is for this team for him to be able to keep them together through that. I think is real. And then I remember his opening press conference. Remember that they rolled him out there at big 10 media days. It felt like his first press con conference ever. And it was not great. Like it was up there with, Nick Sirianni, like Adam Gase, like some of the bad opening press conferences, like, uh-oh, this guy's in over his head. And it didn't mean anything because the players believed in him and they started playing for him and they and he did great. One thing that really hurt my um, thoughts on that was the recent experience of the post-Art Bryles Baylor where Jim Grobe had to come in and take over and it was just a disaster. Mm -hmm. And I that probably informed my expectation that it was not going to go well. So I, I agree with you. That was definitely one of the more impressive uh, coaching jobs, I would say, of a single season that we had of this group. It, it was a very impressive season, but I also wonder if it was like an adrenaline rush kind of season in that, like yeah. if you suffer like a major, like if you break your bone or like your leg or something, it hurts like hell at first, but then there's kind of like your body reacts by like with an adrenaline rush to help cover up the pain. So I'm wondering if that was something that Northwestern is kind of dealing with and now going into the year two like they don't have a stadium right now like I, I posted a photo of it the other day when i was driving by like the only thing standing left at ryan field is the press box like they're they're going to be playing on a practice field there are so many questions i have about this team going into the year two under braun because now he's had an actual off season to get in he's brought in his own staff he's kind of trying to mold the program his own way i don't know who their quarterback is yet they don't have a stadium it's like this is a situation where they could go right back to being three and nine again i i don't know but i think last year to do what they did in that situation was very impressive. Um, the the joke writes itself about the only thing left standing is the press box at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's <laughs> sort of works out. <laughs> Makes total sense. Have you um, seen our It's the only place that's up? been filled for every game. Yeah. <laughs> right. Are they actually going to play in the practice fields on the lake where there's like, yeah, 
That's yeah, playing right now. Yeah, watch. It's tiny. How? Yeah, yeah, I know. You don't think that deploy leverage? I don't think like it's a problem for the Western. No, I don't think it'll be. A, I mean, they're gonna. First of all, it's a very, very nice facility. Like their athletic oh, building that they have in the field there, it is freaking phenomenal. But yeah, it's. I wouldn't expect there to be much of an atmosphere. Twenty twenty four. Who's the best team? Have you already looked at this? Who's the best team that's playing at Northwestern's practice field? Like what is going to be the most high profile game? Oh, Ohio State at Northwestern, November sixteenth, college football playoff race on. And here come the rock star Buckeyes to a practice field. That wind howling in off the lake. Listen, we're going to yeah. be taking a lot of Northwestern home unders this year because there is no protection from that wind. <laughs> Love that. All right, let's let's uh, let's pivot to the Southeastern Conference where we only had two coaching changes and then one of them's already changed again. So, Zach Arnett, Mississippi State, they went five and seven. They've already made a change. They've gone on to hire Jeff Levy. I am uh, more interested, Tom. Hugh Freeze, six and seven. What would you see from from Freeze in year one uh, with the Tigers? I mean, if I had to give it a grade, <laughs> I would be like Danny. I'd go C plus. I, I just it's there. There, I you hire Hugh Freeze last year, and you look at the situation Auburn was in, and it's not the situ not, not similar to Nebraska or Northwestern in these kind of dramatic kind of overhauls but you can argue like Auburn needed to rebuild so when when Hugh Freeze comes in I don't think he should have had super high expectations last year me being a genius I think I took the win total over for them just because I was buying into the Hugh Kool-Aid there for a moment but I think they did a lot of things right I still think they need to solve the quarterback position so I think you look at what's going on off the field they're going in the right direction to where they think that they should be if they want to be competing, you know, for SEC titles and playoff berths and national championships. I think the recruiting has stepped up. I think they've gotten a little more aligned as far as like the NIL and the transfer portal. But again, I still think they need to solve the QB situation because they have not done that in my estimation yet. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the New Mexico State game necessitates that you give them a, a poor grade. Mm -hmm. If he just fixes that, I, I think that it's sort of like an understandable process that they're undergoing. Um, they're really heavy in high school for the first couple of years. I think next year they will have some of those high schoolers hit. And then I think that Auburn will absolutely unload the money cannon into the transfer portal next off season to fix the, to fix the, the positions where the high school recruiting, you know, didn't hit where, wherever their busts are, they'll need to paper over that pretty hard quarterback, you know, potentially being one of them, depending on, on what you think of some of the guys, that they've signed, but in Auburn kind of sat on their wallets here a little bit. And I don't blame them in the same way that I blame LSU, because I don't think that they're in the same like part of the developmental cycle. And, and I don't think Auburn's th throwing away a really good offense this year. If they don't address their defensive line, for instance, but the like, next off season, that's kind of the put up or shut up year for Hugh freeze, you know? And, and I, I think their fans will expect to, you know, make the playoff and contend for the national title. If they didn't have the New Mexico State game, it's probably a B or a B minus. Yeah, because uh, of how well they played against, against Georgia, Georgia, against Bama. Yeah. Like that they didn't really they didn't really win a game that they were underdogs that they weren't supposed to, and they lost the New Mexico State, which they were a heavy favorite. And then all the other games, it's kind of like they were what they were. The the only time I really care about bowl games, by the way, is end of a first year coach's tenure a lot of times you're able to sell like hey we're building towards something this is important Let, let's let's make our last game of the year you know off on a good foot and auburn no showed it like mm -hmm. completely that was one of the worst efforts of bowl season and it wasn't like they had a million opt-outs you know, they just didn't care about the game i think freeze taking over play calling and, and having to fire or reassign some staff some of that was definitely his fault for making bad hires some of that which is HR issues that I don't think he could have foreseen. Uh, so I can't put all of the blame on him there. I think you knew what you hired when you hired Hugh Freeze. Yeah, I also, I also think Hugh has like some kind of like big game hunter tendencies. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, is the New Mexico State game something that we should expect with like the Hugh Freeze? You know, this is, well, this is what you get. Like you're going to get them coached all the way up for these huge games. But a bowl game at the end of a six and six season, your non con against New Mexico State. My, I mean, it wasn't even the opener against Cal a little sloppy. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like all, all, all those spots you were like, man, this team is not, not dialed in, but, um, but yeah, something to keep an eye on as we continue to move forward. Danny, I, uh, you have talked uh, a lot about, and I've agreed with you. I, I spent a lot of time writing about the ACC over the last couple of weeks. So I've been, and it guys, it takes a lot of work to write about ACC football. You know, you, Big Ten, Mr. Big Ten, Tom Fernelli over here gets to just have all the resources in the world. But means I've been spending a lot of time thinking about Georgia Tech. I've been thinking about Brent Key. And Danny, you've talked about it's like Brent Key's energy is infectious. And it was kind of a disjointed season for Georgia Tech, but they finish in the postseason. They finish seven and six. Uh, how, how are you feeling about Brent Key and the way that things went in that first full year? Remember, he did take over midseason for Jeff Collins the year prior, but this was the first year of you know Brent Key running the show. Uh, what'd you think of it? I still think you're bullish. I still think, you know, Georgia Tech fans are optimistic. I do love his energy. I do want a physicality what he's that he's brought to the table. It's kind of like the Auburn season, the bowling green game. Remember, they were a 21-point favorite in that game, which they lost. And then they were a 21-point underdog to Miami, which they won, of course, because of the failed knee at the end of the game. So I guess those wasp each other out, but it is hard to overlook the bowling green loss. And then, I mean, they played Georgia actually maybe better than a lot of teams did in the SEC even this year. But I would, I think you would like to see another step forward this season to kind of continue this momentum, you know, to maybe get to eight wins, maybe to get more of a signature win that's not a fluky knee, you know, like one where they're, you know, a little bit better there. But I think you could get that. I give him incredible bonuses for self scouting when he demoted his defensive staffer. Remember we the Bowling Green game? We we're like, did did they know their signs? Did they? I mean, <laughs> there is no way that Bowling Green's running off like 500 yards of offense against an ACC team. I and mean, look, Georgia Tech was last in the ACC in yards per game allowed, yards per play allowed. Like it was a bad defense, and that is one of the places where Georgia Tech needs to start looking if they want to improve. Also, maybe Haynes King not leading the ACC in both touchdowns and interceptions. Yay, Haynes King led in touchdowns. Oh, no, he led in interceptions, too. Um, but it's, I don't know, Bud, are, are you in on the Brent Key era? I, I am. In, in fact, I think we give Georgia Tech like an A for, uh, for like the resources they had. Let's remember, whether they want to admit it or not, Georgia Tech got essentially turned down by two or three other coaches. Group so, of five coaches. Yes, correct. Yeah. Because they 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 thought Georgia Tech was broke boys, and Georgia Tech had a nice little year, man. Like they, I, I give him a lot of credit for the coaching staff hires he made. I think Buster Faulkner is an excellent. Like he gave a lot of teams trouble. Uh, I don't know if they have any real NIL to work with. If so, I hope that uh, they can improve the defense. I'm not really sure that they did uh, improve the defense this off season, but. They're an exciting team that went to a bowl game in year one after a really you know, pretty disastrous effort under Jeff Collins. So good work. Jeff Brom, the um, Jeff Brom was one of the best in terms of uh, wins in this group. Uh, Jamie Chadwell, obviously the most. Uh, but do you think that Jeff Brom did one of the better coaching jobs that we have, at least among the 25 coaches we're looking at here? No doubt. I mean, look, we were at ACC Media Day, Chip. We were sitting next to each other, and we asked Jeff Brom, like, hey, given the schedule this year, which was light, like, how important is it to cash in? And he was like, look, we're not going to denigrate the schedule, blah, 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 coach speak. But we recognize yes. the opportunity in front of us and the importance of cashing in on it. So, yes, Jeff Brom knew it was an easy schedule. He knew he had to run it. They did. They played for the ACC title. He had, like, so, go ahead, Danny. Don't you think similar to the Ole Miss – bowl appearance that Louisville like that felt a little bit like a whimper Remember, same kind of thing first year coming off season you over exceed expectations you really could have finished with a strong you know ending against the USC team which the defense was disastrous you didn't have Caleb Williams playing like to me that was a and it was an incredible season like I love Jeff Brom love the direction I think he's the right guy but that just felt like you just lost what could have been an exclamation point back to kind of get you back on the up and up on the way out. We're going to yeah. right. get to Deion Sanders in a little bit, and this might be unfair, but I am wondering if the transient nature of the Louisville roster, 
which, you know, like the, the big splashy headline was Penny Boone and Tyler Barron showing up and then leaving, you know, all within a couple months of each other. But just to even review that he had like 30 some odd transfers last year, they're going to have 30 some odd transfers this year. And I think Mike Norvell has earned the benefit of the doubt to say, I can do this because he, he used the transfer portal to get to 10 wins. He used the transfer portal to get to 13 wins. When he goes back into the portal, gets a bunch of guys together. I can say like, all right, I, I, I think you can do it. Jeff Brom has definitely done it in terms of being able to get it done in year one. But I, I do wonder if there's something about the transient nature of that roster, where if there are any cracks, that is something like the holiday bowl would be a spot where we could see it pop up, but still, Jeff Brom, phenomenal job. I, I've got him on that Mike Norvell track where if he does it again, you know, flips the roster and turns in eight, nine, 10 wins. That's just something that I think you can do. Not a criticism of the roster that I would offer, which is something that you know, I, I will do for other coaches and other teams in the country. Um, oh yeah. It's Stanford, Troy Taylor. I don't know what you do there. You got a grade on a curve. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, like multiple quarterback injuries in, a largely un, un, unable to use the transfer portal due to the academics. I guess some of that is is changing. We'll see. Uh, I mean, will they win one Pac-12 game or two? One. One and eight in Pac-12 play. So they beat Hawaii, they beat Colorado, and they they beat Sac, Sac State. Sac State, yeah. his old team. So it's about what I think everybody thought it should be. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, I Stanford Stanford's joining the ACC, and it's not getting any easier. You know, like I I don't know who I I don't know who you're putting Stanford ahead of for sure, right? In the ACC, yeah. I think it gets easier for them than the schedule last year. Oh, okay, that's fair. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I think, but it's yeah. not like they're landing in the conference, and all of a sudden it's like, oh wow, now here's all these like wonderful opportunities. You know, the it's it's going to be. Yeah. So Elijah Brown is the big thing that everyone's hanging their hat on, right? You know, you get the four-star quarterback. He's in there. He's to my eyes, maybe not going to be the starter this year. Ashton Daniels might be able to maintain that position, but that, that is the beginning of starting to turn things around. They got one of the best wide receivers in the country this year in Io Minor. Um, So we'll see. We'll see how things go. Okay. On to the big 12, which of course this year includes Mr. Do you believe? So, how do we all? Uh, how do we ultimately grade year one for Deion Sanders? David Braun took over a Northwestern team that went one and eleven. He went eight and five. Alex Golesh took over a USF team that was in worse shape than Colorado was. They had gone one and eleven. He went seven and six. I mean, Deion took over one and eleven team. He didn't make a bowl game. His coaching failures on the field, like directly led to two losses, like because he had not had to coach in close games at Jackson State because they just had so much more talent than the league that we didn't know if he was a good coach or not. And it turns out through year one, he's a terrible game manager of a coach. Now, hopefully, he gets better in year two. He brought a lot of attention to Colorado, though. And if you're Rick George, do you really think you can win at Colorado? If not, the next best thing is run it like a business, try to sell tickets, make money. So I'm going to give him an A. I don't think Colorado really expects him to win. I think that they expect him to bring a lot of attention and fanfare to the program. I'll go B minus. I just think you've got to judge on wins and losses. If it's a college course where you have three exams, you know, in the first one, they aced it that first. Yeah. Know, I was going to say that you, right, you could say that they, they coasted on the first couple of weeks, like the, <laughs> The successes on the field, right? I mean, they went out, they beat TCU as a 20 point underdog, you know, yeah. like they went yeah. and followed that up with a win against Nebraska. The offense was cooking, you know, there in those first couple weeks. Um, you, you could definitely say that they were had enough money in the bank by the end of September that even though the season fell apart down the field, you, you were still going to have a more, more gains than losses for Colorado football. Right? Correct. Colorado is getting what they want out of Dion. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Right? Um, I mean, now, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, what happens in 2025-26, but for these two years, did I you think see, they're getting what they want. 
Did you see the video that went viral from the spring game? This was probably the most realistic I have seen Dion be because I don't think he thought he was on a national platform and he was talking to the fan base. When he said, I forget the old lady's name, like I think it's Betty or something like that. She's the long, you know, the older lady who's the fan. He's like, where are you? And he waved to her and he said, our goal this year, Betty or whatever her name is, is to get you to a bowl game. I was like, oh, like that's a reasonable goal for Colorado to set, not talking, trying to build up and get clicks and say, we're going to win. That's our what he conference. said. Go play. Yeah. yeah. He On said, first we're take, take... he said he expects to make the playoff. I know, but that's my point is like, it's national champ. Like that's yeah. national television. There's lights on. It's, Hey, let me turn up the bravado. I think they're in a real setting. I think he was being more realistic and to his own fan base, which is not the national, you know, scene. It's, hey, let's make sure I set my expectations realistically, which is a bowl would be phenomenal for them this year. Um, uh, elsewhere, we've got Arizona Thank State you. joining Thank the you. Big 12. Uh, Kenny Dillingham went three and nine. Cincinnati's Scott Satterfield uh, also went three and nine. Danny, which of those two coaches do you have more confidence in being able to take a step forward? Um, Probably Dillingham. Probably a little bit more confidence in him. I don't, I don't know. I, have, I don't have a ton of confidence in either one. And we talked a lot about Satterfield when that move was made. I think Dillingham has a long runway because he's from there. You know, he's from the area, went there. I think there's because of his youth and enthusiasm, he gets a, l- a little bit of a longer runway. But I don't I feel think, great about yeah, either one. I think one. Arizona State's getting just kneecapped right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I, I, but he yeah. also that again gives him a little bit more forgiveness. Hey, That's we true. have to deal with you know the sanctions coming down. I have more confidence in Satterfield this year. I have kind of equal confidence in them over the long term, I, I think. I mean, Satterfield is more proven as a head coach. Arizona State schedule is just not it, – it's not a winnable slate for any of like the – like they, they got really crushed schedule-wise, which maybe they're okay with because I think they realize like they're not in position to win anything this year anyway. But you know, year three will be really important there. Um, Here's the thing with Cincinnati, though. They were they're a program that was in the playoff not that long ago. Like it should you took over a program that I know it wasn't as healthy last coming off last year as it was then, but it shouldn't be that dramatic of a drop off. You know, like Arizona State's kind of is what there was a like it was a disastrous tenure before you. You were taking over a dumpster fire. You had these sanctions looming. That's why I give Arizona State a little bit more of a pass too. And uh, Dillingham. The, I mean, so even Tommy Tuberville, nine wins, nine wins, seven wins. Obviously, Butch Jones, 10 wins, 10 wins. Brian Kelly. I mean, I just, it, Cincinnati football it sh- should have all like good, it's a house with good bones, you know? Like, I think that he's, he's at least got a little bit more, um, you know, infrastructure support just based on even the program's proud history. So I'll, I'll take Satterfield there. And I, I've, I've waffled on Satterfield. You know, he, s- Awesome job at App State, right? And then he hits the ground running at Louisville. And then he has those comments about the South Carolina job and kind of loses his fan base a little bit. And then he sees the the restart the clock move to Cincinnati, but it's happening right as Cincinnati's joining the Big 12 and they've lost 10 NFL draft picks. You know, it's just nobody, none of the new additions in the Big 12 did well last year. They all jumped into the conference and sank straight to the bottom of the standings. So... I think Cincinnati at least has the infrastructure to be able to move up uh, here in the coming year. 